And Chris was joking when I came in, or when he came in, I was up here with my little notebook, and he said, you can't, it's too late to write it now. And truth being told, for whatever reason, I had the 16th. I'm thinking, okay, i got to do the 16th, and, the, and then I came in, I just happened to glance at the calendar and said, uh, no, today's the 9th, and I'm on there. And, I, and then I was the one that wrote it on the calendar. But, um, but the only thing that keeps me from panicking is, well, that I'm among family, number one. But, you know, Scripture tells us to always be ready to give an answer, always be ready to give an account of the joy that lies within you and that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, it's probably good sometimes when you – are put on the spot, and you have to, um, you know, you have to do. And I remember Mr. Nix always said he had forgotten his sermon notes one time when he came to Troutman, and he gave a sermon that day. But he said he had always, you know, it's one of his nightmares that he had about, you know, what do you do when you get to a place and you don't have your sermon notes? And it happened to him. And I remember one time Ralph Hanahan came to Statesville too without his sermon notes and he went back up to the store, called his daughter or somebody and had him, and that's back in the days when people used fax machines and the store happened to actually have one, so he had his sermon notes faxed to him and came back and gave a sermon. But Henry always said if all, if all else fails, you can always give a sermon from from um, I think it's Luke chapter 5, I believe it's, it's the Beatitudes or what we call the, what's what's been referred to as the Beatitudes. And I think that's actually where he gave a sermon that day. And I'm not giving you a sermon on the Beatitudes today, and I'm not necessarily going to give you a sermon at all. If anything, it would be a sermonette, and then probably more just a more like a little testimony um, before Chris comes up and, and gives us what he has. But um, there's also a scripture like that in Acts chapter 19 uh, that I'll get to in a minute. But, um, or to me, anyway. Um, and there's lots of scriptures like that. I know that there's, you know, scriptures throughout the, the Bible where um, God is telling us the things that he would love to do for us if we were willing and we sought him openly and freely and with, a, with, with joy in our hearts. And, you know, sometimes I think when, when we think about that scripture that says be ready always to give an answer or... or you know, to speak about the joy that's within you. What do you believe? What makes you What makes you tick from a religious, and I don't even like to use the word religious, but from a spiritual standpoint? Obviously, people see us, and they know that we do things a little bit differently than, than your average bear, and I think we, we should always be ready to give an answer and, and to be able to testify of there's got to be something in our hearts. Brother, and I remember a kid, a song as a kid, you know, I've got this joy, joy, joy down in my heart, and... You know, I think sometimes we we let the world take that away from us. And, you know, maybe we don't always think we're serving a God of joy, or at least in our minds we think we're, you know, we've got to be serious about this and serious about that. We've got to talk about the conditions of the world, and we've got to, we've got to think about how far we are down the, down the road to the end and, you know, all these different things. But um, I can't necessarily come up with an impromptu message, but I can... I think tell you where my mind has been, um, not exclusively, of course, um, but I do know something that's been on my heart this week and something that I've been trying to do different than the norm, not that I never do it, but I, it's, it's really been something, and it comes from, um, well, I want to read, and this, let me tell you this, we were having a conversation, Katrina and I, when she came home from work on Tuesday, I think, and it was just her and I in the living room, we were having a conversation, and, and we were talking about, you know, the outlook for the future, not just for us personally, but just, you know, when, when things that we can do or, or should think about doing and things that we, you know, may be out of our reach and all these different things, and, you know, I'm thinking, and we came up with this little thing about, you know, what we wanted to do because she was so, the reason we were having this conversation is because she just sat down and cried telling me about her, you know, and, and, and it bothered me to see so much stress job-related. Um, you know, I'm trying to encourage her, and, you know, it, it's just outside those walls. It's just, you know, and, and it's, you got to put things in perspective like that sometimes. And it, and I know you take it seriously when you got a, a position or whatever and you think, you know, all this stuff is riding on me. And there is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of weight there and a lot of things that, 
um, would cause any of us to stress out, I guess. But then, you know, us thinking about what our future looks like if time lasts, and it's like I told somebody here last week, the, the sand's always trickling through the hour, hourglass, but it seems like that hole's getting bigger and it's starting to just pour through, and you know that we're getting, you know, farther down that road. But if time lasts, what do we, what do we want to do? What do we, you know, we want to do something together and at least have the option of, of, you know, her not having to always be in a stressful, you know, um, there's, there's lots of things about her job that she loves, but then there's, there's just so much stuff. And, you know, and it's, Mary and I even had a conversation this week. She's had some issues with her job and, um, and, and, you know, wanted to think about going somewhere else. And I encouraged her to do that, but I also told her, you know, I've been doing it for, 30, however many years now, 33, 34, however long it's been working in the public, you know, and it, and you will find, even though a change of atmosphere may make it better for a little while, but you find out wherever you go, people are people are people are people, and, and some of the, some things are just prevalent everywhere. You know, you go to a place, new place to work, and you like it, and then you find out there's the cliques, and there's the, you know, that certain people are doing certain things, and other people can't do, you know what I mean, and it's, that's why I encourage her not to do what I did and, and get into working these. Because if you work for a company, that's just you know that's just what happens. You you got somebody telling you when to come to work, when to leave work, when you can take a break, when you can't take a break. You know what days to be there, what days not to be there, when you can take a vacation, when you can't. You know all these different things, and that's what's always bothered me about being an employee is not being in control of my own schedule and, and being somebody else's property for you know, 40, 50 hours a week. But, it, I mean, that's the way things get made and the way things get done. But it's just, and some people are perfectly fine with that. I'm not one of those people. But anyway, get, without getting completely sidetracked, we were having this conversation about our future and what, what we would like to do and some of our dreams. And then you think about some of those things that can happen. And then, But then it just so happened I was rushing that conversation a little bit because I was to go pick up the food because we weren't going to cook that night. And... And I told her not to worry about it because I knew she was already stressed out before she got home. And I told her, I said, don't worry about dinner. I'll pick, I'll pick something up. And, and she got there before I left. We had this conversation. But I'm on my way. I get in her car. And she's got the XM radio on. And it's on a certain station. And I've, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a religious station. And obviously it's not, you know, United Church of God or, you know, that kind. But it's. So, but there's worse things, you know what I mean? So I'm, and I'm tempted to reach and turn it because, you know, it's a sermon. It's a, and I don't really care for that. And, but I left it for whatever reason, which was not typical for me. But once I'm going out the road, and I'm not going to tell you who the, the, the pastor or the minister is because you would tune out the rest of what I say. Because I know that's kind of, because some of you are the same way as far as, the earthly ministers. But I'm glad I listened to this the last 15 minutes, I guess, of this message because there are some things in there that made and have been on my mind for the rest of the week. And the name of his message was Focus on the Promises and Not the Problem. And where he got my attention was when he's saying, as I was backing out of the driveway, he was saying, you know, you can take a dime out of your pocket and he said, if you're standing outside, you can hold that dime up at arm's length, and it doesn't block out much. He said, but even though that dime is millions and millions and millions of times smaller than the sun, if you keep pulling it closer to your eye pretty soon, it, it's bigger than the sun. It blocks out, and that's what he was saying that about problems. That's what we do with our problems. We magnify our problems, even though it's this big, but we keep pulling it closer, and we keep pulling it closer, and we think it's this big, huge, oh, I don't know how I'm ever going to get through this. And what it does is it, it blocks out everything else. But then he goes through all these, not all of them, but he goes through a lot of scriptures where God is saying, if you will, you know, this is what I want to do for you. And I believe that. I, I do believe that there is things that God wants to do for us. And we don't, we don't magnify God enough. We don't, we don't give him enough, we don't give him enough latitude to do what he would be willing to do in our lives. But that's kind of where my mind has been. So even during the week, I've found several times, just like mowing the grass yesterday at home and, and, and 
You know, everything, because we all know that during our a day in our lives, there are several instances where we think something is, that was a good thing that happened. And we don't want to let those times go past and not say, thank you. If that's all we say, thank you, God. That was, that was a nice thing that happened to me. But I've been trying this week to practice that, magnifying God. God, you are great. There is nothing can stand, even as I said in the opening prayer, in that prayer for the prayer request, nothing can stand before you. And I think during those times when I'm doing that, I'm in a better, so I, I, know, I feel like it works. We'll see. I'll get back to you. But I, want to do, I do want to turn to a scripture in Acts chapter 19. Um, and our, you know, our apostle Paul, the dynamo, um, gone from one direction to the other, from persecuting Christians to being their biggest advocate and getting himself in trouble, maybe not getting himself in trouble, but just by giving that testimony and, and, and speaking of the joy that's within him, you know, gets him into trouble. And then when we find him in Acts chapter 19, he's getting close to some more of that trouble. Acts chapter 19, I'm going to skip down to verse 11. And God wrought, spe and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. So that from his body, now this is, this is kind of hard to imagine, but it says God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. That's, you know, it's kind of like the shadow of Peter, and you know, these different things that happen, and you think, this is, this is God. This is the God that we talk about. This is the God that we come here to honor. This is the God that we worship and say that we belong to and that we're his children. We want to be in his family. He's going to resurrect us from the dead. You know what I mean? This is a human being. Yes, it's the Apostle Paul, which we, we put on a, you know, we kind of put on a pedestal and not that we shouldn't a little bit because he's, you know, God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul. That diseases were healed and evil spirits went away. Just from the handkerchiefs and the aprons. There were seven sons, well it says in verse 13, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits. <laughs> and I like this because it's, a, it's, it's one of the comical places in the Bible to me. It's serious, but it's comical because of what happens. He can do it. God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, and these diseases are departing, and the, and the evil spirits are departing. So these vagabond Jews, these exorcists, took upon themselves to call over them which had evil spirits. The name of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to call the name of the Lord Jesus over you, and there's people that will tell you, you can, you can admonish any spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, you can, but you, you have to be a little bit careful, right? This, these people here thought, okay, all I, got, all I got to do is use that name. Not that that name doesn't have great power, but they're just going to call this name over him saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now that's not, doesn't sound like a lot of faith, does it? But their faith is in what Paul's able to do, not what Jesus Christ is able to do. We, we call over you the name of Jesus Christ that Paul preaches, that, that person. So go, get. Well, what does, he, what does the scripture say? Doesn't it say even the, the demons know and tremble? Well, they're not trembling here. Because they recognize right away. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, Sceva, whatever his name is, a Jew, and chief of the priests which did so. Seven sons. And the evil spirit <laughs> answered, Now, if I'm exercising a demon... I don't want a conversation. I don't. I don't. I don't need. <laughs> I don't need you to talk back to me. Okay. I've I've seen the Exorcist, um, which is not what this is. But but you know. Anyway, the evil spirit answered and said, "Yeah, Jesus, I know. I know who he is. Jesus, I know, and Paul. I know him too. Who are you?" Wait, that's not how this is supposed to go. You know, it's funny. It's it's it, you know when you see you can you can almost see the color drain from these you know people. Oh, I'll call the name of Jesus over this evil spirit. Watch this. In the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, for whatever that's worth, 
Get out. <laughs> Excuse me. I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? So the man, <laughs> the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them. Now it's bad enough to have a conversation. He's talking back to you now. He's going to jump out on you. That's, that's a bad day. That's a bad day. And overcame them and prevailed against them, apparently ripping off their clothes, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And what, ha what was the result? This was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Now, the, the, the person I'm referring to about this sermon didn't, didn't read this scripture or even refer to this scripture. But his message was still the same. Focus on the promises and not the problem. If you want something to be taken care of, focus on the solution to the problem, which is God. We often ask God when we get in severe trouble, but a lot of times we've dragged that little thing that started out as something small so close that it's huge and it's blocking out everything else. We can't see anything else but this problem that's huge in our lives. And I'm thinking as I'm listening to this message, you know, maybe, maybe I don't have enough joy. Maybe I don't have enough good news about what I believe. Because it, it's not all bad. It's not all about the world's crumbling around us and we're... We're headed down this path of destruction, and oh my goodness, it's going to be bad. We better look out for tomorrow. It's going to be, and a lot of that's true. But I think sometimes when we're doing that, maybe God isn't magnified enough. You know, I don't know, but this says that the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. You know, we just had this conversation, and I get in the car. And normally I would have turned this, but I, I, before I made my trip and got back home, I just felt like you know, it was meant for me to hear what was said, no matter who it was coming from. God can use any vessel, any tool he wants to use. Because you know, I'm, not in a, I'm, not in a, I'm not at the pinnacle of my professional life, if I've ever had a professional life. I am going to school two days a week. I'm 30, I got 32 hours of class behind me. They pick up again next week. I've got to have 75 hours of class. Hopefully I can pass the state exam and get a broker's license to be a real estate broker or to parlay that into something else. I don't know. Number one, I just wanted to learn something. I wanted to learn again. I wanted to get back in a, in a book and, and, and get my brain functioning on something besides. And I do think it's an opportunity. In times past, you know, we wouldn't have been able to survive on, on one income. And, and that's what we're doing. We're not, you know, we're not living it up by any means. But, you know, we, we thought this would be a good opportunity for me to change course. Manufacturing hasn't worked out for me. And I'm not saying I won't go back into manufacturing. But I want to do something else. And I want to do, hopefully at some point, be a little bit more in charge of my own schedule. But we'll see what happens. And it's a little bit of a selfish reason that I've been magnifying God, trying to give God the credit that he deserves and the thing that he the things that he wants to do for us and it's and sometimes people get especially about this particular minister and y'all probably already know who it is you know that he's too flowery that he's a, he teaches a, a gospel of prosperity and, and he does but that doesn't mean there's not some truth in there and that's normally the reason I would have turned out, I don't need to hear this I don't need to hear this stuff Oh, it's about flowers and sunshine and unicorns and rainbows and, you know. But sometimes there's a little bit of meat in there. And you got to, you know, you got to get through the other stuff. And it's just for me. And I, and I said when I got up here, this was just a little bit of a testimony. You know, when I see a problem in front of me, and God doesn't promise that there's not going to be problems. But we serve a, we serve a, a great big God who can do things for us and has done things for us. We're all living testimonies of what God has done. We've heard them here. We've heard testimonies about what God is able to do. But I think it's just, it helps me, it will help me going forward in whatever I plan to do if I know that and, and I, I'm, I make God bigger than my problems because he does offer good things. You know, 
we've, we've, we've heard about before the lemon juice Christians and, and, you know, how they're, you know, people who know what we know and people who understand what we understand and have hope and what we have hope in should be some of the happiest people on the planet. But we're not. We're not always the happiest. I'm, I'm, I can be right down grumpy sometimes. And I let a lot of things get under my skin. Am I going to change that tomorrow? Am I going to be? Am I going to go from one dwarf to the other, from happy to from grumpy to happy? No, probably not. But I have to start somewhere. Everything starts with a ripple. First thing is, it's like an alcoholic, or, you know, realizing that you've got this problem, and then admitting it, and then trying to do something about it. Maybe I'm on the the twelve steps of. <laughs> being a happier Christian. I don't know. It's not that I'm not happy and it's not that I don't feel blessed. I just, you know, I've got to not sweat the small stuff and not be a, you know, be, be a happier person. And I know some of the times we, we play down some of this stuff is because, well, you know, it's the, it's the resurrection to everlasting life that's the, the primary goal, and it is. Nothing changes that. Nothing changes the fact that the sand is going through the hourglass. Nothing changes the fact that we're moving down the road. Nothing changes the fact that all, all that's going to be pleasant. But brethren, we serve a great and mighty God, and he's much bigger than our, and his promises are bigger than the problems. Resurrection to eternal life is the primary goal. I want to skip down uh, in verse 18. And many believed. I'm actually not skipping. I'll stop at verse 17. Verse 18 says, And many that believed came because of this little event that happened here, Fear fell, you know, fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many, believe, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. What else is required, brethren? Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. He's magnified, isn't he? And these are the results. You know, I could turn over to Acts chapter 20, um, starting in verse 17. I could turn on over to where, you know, Paul, Paul gets arrested, right? And they find out he's a Roman, and it makes them all, you know, there's Festus and Felix and these different people that are putting him on trial, and he's, 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 he's imprisoned, he's in chains, and he's given an account of himself, and it's, you know, several chapters in Acts that are just powerful, powerful statement of what Paul you know, is given an answer of himself and the joy that lies within him. And he, and he pounds on the, resur on the resurrection, so much so that when they take him before King Agrippa, remember? And he comes out there and he starts from his childhood, Paul does, and he gives a highlight of his life. And he says, what is it that I'm being condemned for? Because I preach the resurrection or because I believe that God is going to resurrect the, the good and the bad? Because that's something we tend to forget too, not forget, but... We don't emphasize that very much. We're not, not only the righteous that will be resurrected, so will the wicked. But the end of, if there's not a, <laughs> a big change, but they're all going to be resurrected. But he gives, he gives a moving message there, and it's just a testimony. And King Agrippa said, you know, Paul, you almost convinced me to be a Christian. You know, and it's, it's, um, it's a great story. And I'm just here to give you this little testimony, brethren. Sorry I wasn't better prepared for today, but sometimes you just have to go off the cuff, and that's probably good for me. But I will have to agree with Joel Osteen on this one. We serve a great God, and we do much better if we magnify God and not the problem. 